Welcome to the complete collection of Reggie Miller's greatest stories, told by NBA players and legends. If you have missed any of the other episodes in the series, there is a playlist link in the description box down below and on the top right of your screen. If you click on that link, you'll find all the episodes within this series. Thank you to everybody who commented that they would like to see a Reggie Miller episode. This one is for you. If you guys have any other suggestions, comment them down below and let me know which player you would like to see next in this series. Without further ado, all I ask is that you please leave a like on this video to show your support. These videos do take a long time to edit and produce. If you are new, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you enjoy the video and the rest of the series. And hit that notification button so you stay up to date with all the new episodes as soon as they release. And enjoy the episode. He loved the big moments. He loved the big games. Reggie Miller is, is, is one of my favorite teammates of all time because he is he's a, he's a winner. As an opposing player, I really didn't like him too much. <laughs> and uh, that's a compliment. Reggie Miller is one of the best pure shooters that I've ever played against. He, he was always talking and flopping. Me talking about flopping, yeah. <laughs> but flopping. I think it was game three. He hit me with a bow. Stark, shut up and play. I like, okay, I know that. I, I can handle this. He was, everybody saw it, and, and then he did that. And both those things were directed towards me. Playing against Reggie and coaching Reggie and, and knowing his personality, Reggie's hit more shots uh, in crucial times than about anybody I've ever seen. Every time I go in that fucking game and come out, I got a new scratch. It became personal with me. Hey, we, we talk about clutch shot makers. I'm not putting myself on that list. So to it's me, not gonna be real. To me, Reggie Miller. I'm not putting myself on that list. To me, Reggie you. Miller was one of the clutch shot makers ever in this league. And when we talk about clutch, I'm not talking about at the end of the game. Reggie Miller would make those shots when you down four and you need a bucket to stay in the game. Playing against Reggie and coaching Reggie and, and knowing his personality, Reggie's hit more shots uh, in crucial times than about anybody I've ever seen. He loved the big games. He loved the playoffs uh, or the big marquee matchups against his arch rival, whether it was Michael Jordan or somebody or the Knicks. He got up, the bigger the game, the bigger Reggie Miller would perform and play, the better. And uh, this guy was just unstoppable. A lot of guys miss those shots, but the shots that you got to make to stay, to keep up with the team that's pulling away, that's when you got a shot maker. And to me, Reggie's on that. So, if I had to pick a team that gave us the toughest time in the East, you know, Indiana was probably the toughest outside of Detroit. They were tough. Every time I go in that fucking game and come out, I got a new scratch. It became personal with me. I knew that I had to bring it each and every time I stepped on the court when I was going against MJ. Were you your friends? No. On three, takes it to the basket, and it's kicked in. Oh, and Reggie Miller came over and smacked All right, right okay, yeah. and MJ is upset yeah. about it, and I can't blame him. Yes, sir, he ran right in. Don't hold him back. Let him go. You know, looking back over 18 years, you'd have thought that Michael and I, the Bulls and the Pacers, would have played more than once in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. We only played once, and it was that epic seven-game series. We saw your, uh, your happy dance earlier in the show. Ten years later, Reggie Miller did sort of a modified Zeke happy dance after a game winner against the Bulls. And recently, he explained to us just how it was that he got himself open. Well, I knew Ron Harper was guarding me, and I knew that they were going to switch Michael Jordan, who was, I believe, guarding Mark Jackson or someone up top. I remember when Larry was drawing the play, I was thinking, put all the pressure on the official to make a call. So when I came up, I knew uh, the switch was going to happen. I knew they were going to switch, and MJ was going to be on me. So I just went right to his chest and lightly lightly shoved him a little bit to create that space, and the rest was history. Elbowed, nudged, okay, shoved, 
Michael Jordan out of the way to create that separation and go to the pass where Derek was going to lead me. And uh, it was a perfect pass, per perfect execution, and the rest is history. Now, i got to ask you, where was Randy Brown going? He knew. Randy knew. As soon as the ball touched my hands, game time. All right, let's get ready for the next one. Randy knew. Isn't that right, Randy? Will you talk about, you know, Reggie before the game said that because he spent some time with you on the movie set this summer, that your relationship with him has improved, that you guys had a chance to talk. Can you expand on that? It's just a mutual respect. You know, I think, uh, you know, we had a chance to play against each other, play on each other's side, and you know, I got to know him as a person. He still competes hard, you know, each, each time we go against each other, but it's a mutual respect there, and, you know, I'm glad I had the chance to sit down and talk to him and, you know, just spend some quality time with him to see what type of person he is, and, you know, he's a great competitor. Reggie Miller is the, a great, great basketball player, but if you stop and think, he's been the only player that ever got Michael Jordan ejected. <laughs> so there's got, there ain't a better talker around than Reggie Miller if he can take the best player and most disciplined player in the league and get him upset. Reggie Miller does a lot of talking. Reggie Miller does a lot of talking. Talk to you from the time you come out the locker room here, run you right back into it. Tonight, Phil Jackson's crew is trying to get back on track. In fact, the Bulls have all kinds of incentive in meeting Indiana. Professional and personal reasons for wanting to hand these Hoosiers their head. They lost it by 21, 135 to 114, ending what at the time was an 11-game winning streak. All that was bad enough, but the Bulls then had to chew on some post-game remarks by Indiana's Reggie Miller. Reggie had just lit him up for 40 points and then issued the following statement. 100% bulletin board material here, definitely off-key to the ears of some of those so-called Bulls nobodies. Reggie's remarks were made three weeks ago. As of Thursday, some of the Bulls could still repeat the quotes verbatim. You know, Reggie's always talked a lot, you know, even out on the floor. Uh, you know, it's up to us to to prove that uh, that he's wrong. I like to, you know, tell guys uh, if their games were sold in the store, uh, it would be buy one and get one free. You're not a good talk trasher, then you really can't play. You got to have a good game and a good talk game. Miller knows he's hard to stop, and he likes to make sure opponents know it too. Usually, I would guess you were imagining yourself wearing the uniform of the L.A. Lakers. That was your team as a kid, right? Yes, it was. You know, I grew up. A Laker fan. Everyone wanted to be Magic Johnson. It was magic, magic, magic. You know, having a chance to go to UCLA and then, you know, work with Magic and Byron and Michael Cooper. You know, those guys were, you know, like gods to me. Look at Reggie and Magic. Can try to psych him. You know, Magic, you, you know you can't make these two. You know you Magic can't make it. Ignore him. <laughs> In the last game of the Great Western Forum, Magic needed a couple of free throws to put the ball game away, and Reggie Miller harassed him. <laughs> what are you saying to him? Well, see, you know, Magic and I are good friends, and, you know, they needed those two free throws to win the game, and I was just trying to get in his ear, trying to distract him a little bit. I told him, you know, if he misses one of these games, you know I'm going to put the game on ice with the three, and he just started laughing. <laughs> well, anytime you have a great score, uh, that is an opposing score. Your game plan defensively is around that guy. How do you slow him down? How do you stop him? And Reggie was no different than any other great player. There are some guys I've guarded, and I said, well, I don't know what he's going to do. What, it, what was crazy about Reggie to me was he was shooting a jump shot. But Reggie Miller was a guy who will run you off a thousand screens. <laughs> And then catch and shoot three. <laughs> and it was just, um, he was so tough to guard. He's so crafty. He was smart. And he just, he just knew how to play the game and, and, and piss you off at the same time. Reggie Miller is one of the best pure shooters that I've ever played against. Reggie was so clutch. You know, that's, he wanted the ball in his hands. And he had a unique ability to draw fouls. It's hard to guard him, coming off screens. You know, he could also put it on the floor and take it to the basket. So he's always able to keep the defense off balance. Uh, that's what they don't talk about a lot, but his jump shot was one of the purest I've ever seen. You had a game plan, how are you going to slow him down, how are you going to stop him, how you keep the ball out of his hands by trying to deny him, but he, he moved so well without the ball, it was hard to stop because he never stopped moving. A little unorthodox, it looked really funny, but he would make him. You don't ever want to leave him. He was a good athlete, and at 6'7", he had the length and the height to shoot right over most people. But to be able to run, shove, grab, fight, back in the day, we run through the butt, butt, backstop. Yep. He did whatever it took to get open. And you knew he was shooting a jump shot. And the bad part about it was 
you didn't want to foul him. Because he was such a great free throw shooter. You don't want, you, you want to get your hands caught uh, and foul him. So he creates space. And that's all he needed was a little space to get that shot off. He kicked his foot out, too. He kicked that foot out. He grabbed that foot. And it seemed like he, he was the higher percentage shooter with the game on the line than he was actually probably during the middle of the game. He loved the big moments. And it didn't take him long to get that shot off. You know, when you see a guy shoot the ball that quick with that much accuracy, uh, I think of Reggie Miller. My favorite was to watch you against Reggie because I hated Reggie the most. I yeah. mean, everybody did. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> I mean, I remember when you headbutt him, and it's still one of the most bittersweet moments yeah. because we were all like, yes, he got him. And then we're yeah. like, God, we lost Starks. That needed to happen. I, you know, tell you, I hated Reggie. 94 was the Pacers coming out party, yeah. but it really started in 93. We had played them in the first round series the year before and lost them five games. That's when I kind of knew that we could compete on that stage. Reggie was one of those players that he didn't, he didn't respect you. You know what I mean? If he didn't respect you, he's gonna come at you, he's gonna talk noise, he's gonna do all the dirty little things. And that particular time, I can remember, he kept hitting me with bowls uh, during the playoffs game. And he was, I think it was game three. He hit me with a bowl and I told the referee, and the referee wasn't, Stark, shut up and play. I like, okay, I know, I, I can handle this. And so Patrick said, you cool? I said, yeah, I'm cool. So I ran down, scored on him, and ran up to court. And I was so mad. I mean, like, oh, man, I want to just take my fist and just put it right through his face, right? <laughs> and uh, just, you know, I'm talking to him, you know, in a polite way. And we just got close, and I just, bam. I'm like, just, some just came up and tapped him like that. And he know he dramatic Hollywood. <laughs> oh, you get like this and that. And I can remember Oak and Patrick just beating on me. And I didn't feel them until after the game and when I saw the replay and they was hitting me. Bam, bam, bam. And my mother called Patrick and told him, if you ever put your hands on my son again. <laughs> and he told, he said, Miss Starks, if you do that again, I'm gonna do the same thing. So. You fast forward to 1994 in the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, we beat Atlanta, who I thought was the number one seed at that time. And now you're going against the number two seed, the bullies on the block, <laughs> the number one media market, Patrick Ewing, Pat Riley, and the Knicks. And you're on center stage. This is for you, Indiana. We're coming back. Yeah. What I just said, I wanted to put Indiana on the map. Well, what better place to do it than going against the number one media market team and the Knicks? He was talking uh, in game three, you know, but... That didn't bother me at all. It was just, you know, when somebody starts to uh, take cheap, uh, cheap shots on you, then, uh, you know, you can only take so much. What did your teammates tell you at the court when you walked off? <laughs> they told me it was uh, a bad move on my part, which it was. And uh, I accept the blame, and, uh, you know, but we have to deal with it and, and move on. I don't think I, I did anything to John to make him mad. I think something happened earlier in the day. Maybe room service was late or something, or something like that. But I don't think it was what, uh, between him and I, I don't think that's what made him upset. And then the things that come with the Knicks, like some of their fans. Speaking of edgy, we also know all too well that Spike Lee is a basketball fan, a Knicks fanatic to be exact. We've witnessed his antics and frustrations courtside for years. So I met Spike a few times. We weren't buddy-buddy or cool or anything like that. So we played uh, the Knicks a couple times during the regular season. We caught fire. You know, we beat Orlando. We beat Atlanta. Now we're getting ready to play the Knicks. And I get a phone call, and it's Spike. And he's like, well, do you want to make a little wager? I'm like, sure, I'll make a wager, because we're going to do you guys. He's like, okay. Well, what do you want? Well, you know, my wife at the time, who was trying to be an actress, it's like, okay, well, put her in one of your, you know, do the right thing movies. No kidding. Yeah, and if it's the Knicks won, he wanted me to go visit, at the time, Mike Tyson was in jail in Indiana uh, because of everything that had happened to him. He wanted me to go visit Iron Mike. So that... That's kind of what set the stage between he and I. 25-point fourth quarter. Swings away and hits! 39-point game, June 1st, 1994. What do you remember from that game, and I guess in particular that quarter? You talk about out-of-body experiences. <laughs> that might have been the third or fourth time I've had that feeling on the court. Miller open again! I'm going to either shoot my way in, 
I'm gonna shoot us out. I hear, you know, who we're on the sidelines, you know, hey, you going down, India Hicks. I'm hearing all this, I'm like, okay. I'm gonna try to shoot this ball every single time just to make a point. Look at this shot, and he hits it! It's a three-pointer for Reggie Miller! Well, I started to make my first couple shots that started that fourth quarter, and I started to look over at Spike a little bit, and he was kind of, <laughs> things started to come out my mouth. And Reggie Miller in an animated discussion with Spike Lee. The looks, the taunts. Who again is staring in the direction of, yes, that man. You know, the finger pointing, grabbing, choking, and magic was born. It was just like, you just snap, and, you know, grab this private. You know, it was very public. I mean, it was, everybody saw it, and, and then he did that, and both those things were directed towards me. I got tired of hearing his damn mouth. And, you know, like, you know what? It's entertainment, and you pay good money for these seats. But you ain't gonna talk to me any old kind of way. Somehow, he was unleashing his wrath <laughs> against me. That like I was playing or something. Do you ever wonder if he hadn't been sitting there and egging you on, if your performance would have been that good, or Probably did that not. did that fuel it? I think it kind of fueled it because when I started to make some of those crazy shots, you know, I almost made one from half court. I'm like, this, what is going, this is like a video game that's going on right now. If it wasn't for the looks and the antics, it probably wouldn't have been the same. What do your teammates say to you during timeouts? What were guys from the Knicks saying to you on the floor? They had to just be going, holy smokes. I remember Byron Scott and Sam Mitchell coming up to me with towels and fanning me down. They weren't, I was like in a different zone. So in timeouts, Larry Brown would be talking and I wouldn't hear it. I wasn't hearing a word he was saying. I was just in my own little world. Let's just go play. Um, I don't care what happens, we're gonna do this, and yes, yeah, so I was having, I was in my own world. Miller's dramatic display carried the Pacers to victory, announcing his arrival as an NBA star, turning Spike into a scapegoat for the Knicks' defeat. I'm on the front page, me being blamed for the loss. He is their biggest fan, and God bless him. I, everyone should have a Spike Lee that's that loyal. The next year, you know, he did the same thing. Game that's seen nearly 60 fouls ball. And actually, that is short of the record for both teams in the playoff game. Miller for three, and he got it. That was like a movie. Yeah. Look, I was so disappointed and dejected in that game because I felt we had played well enough to win it. We hadn't done all the little things, the rebounding, the loose ball, the 50-50 balls, you know, missed free throws. And it seemed that they were going to win that game. So now we have our worst inbounder, Anthony Mason, take it out. Greg Anthony was wide open. I threw it to him. He slipped. And I kind of see his foot stumble just a little bit as he's taking the ball out. And I kind of nudged Greg Anthony, and he fell. I didn't know Anthony Mason was going to throw me the basketball again. And I made the three, so I knew they didn't have any timeouts. Reggie <laughs> absolutely shoved Greg Anthony. It was the best chance pass from either team. In the heat of the moment, Sam Mitchell fouls John Starks. I think everyone got caught up in the emotion, including Sam Mitchell, because maybe he thought we were down one, but it was tied up. He fouls John Starks as soon as the ball comes in, and we're running up to him like, what are you doing? It's tied. I'm like, it's, all, it's okay. It's all right. Because yeah. worst case scenario, we could score at the other end. If he makes both of these, we could score at the other end, and we'll just go to overtime and take our chances. I was kind of like in shock that this whole thing happened. At that time, I'm walking to the free throw line, and I'm thinking like, man, did this dude just did it? We watched John's eyes, and he wanted no parts of the functions. There's no way he's going to miss the second free throw. There's absolutely no way. Stocks misses the foul shot. Ewing misses the putback. There is a time to play, and there's a time to win. What do you do in winning time? That differentiates between just a regular player and a superstar. Reggie Miller scoring eight points in the final seconds. Mason choked and threw it to me. I hit a three. John Stark choked. We came up big. 
he's one of the great adversaries that I ever had to coach against. And, you know, I knew that when I was coaching against him that I had nothing but respect for him. Uh, but Reggie is, uh, is, is absolutely one of the all-time greats. Uh, I mean, when you talk about his kind of game and how he played, uh, there were only one or two other guys, you know, in the same circle. Reggie Mill is, is, is one of my favorite teammates of all time because he is, he's, a, he's a winner, right? Yeah. He's a winner in every aspect of the word. And he could have easily deaded that trade. Easily. Trade for him, trade me. Mm. He's like, nah, bring in the young boy. I remember, he, I remember having a conversation. He said, I'm going to let you be whatever you want to be as long as you work for it. That's dope. He did, this, he did the same family. for me. Reggie did the same for me. Especially yeah, coming, coming Reg, from Hall of Fame. Reggie is, is unbelievable, bro. He meant so much to, to me in my career. And that's why that, that, that brawl situation, I probably wanted to win it more for him yeah. than it was for myself. Right. We were just coming back from losing to Detroit the year before. And I thought it was our best year probably to win the championship mm -hmm. with this new core. Steven Jackson was just added to the team. Ron Artest, Jermaine O'Neal, Al Harrington. You know, we had a pretty good, nice, young nucleus. Did you enjoy when it was your time to be a mentor? Did I you, loved it. Did you, and, who, and who were some of your pupils? Al Harrington, the best. At, at the time, Steven Jackson. Though at times he could be a little rough around the edges, deep down, I know Steven Jackson has a good heart. Jermaine O'Neal, he was my locker mate right next to me. To just touch on what he said, they brought me in the next year, the year Reggie was retiring. And Reggie was basically stamping me as the person to fill in when he leaves, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that year was special for all of us for, for Reggie. Reggie, you know what I mean? Because we knew we had the team, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and to not do it, was a, it was a letdown. Even though we came back and still fought in the playoffs, it was a letdown for all of us because we wanted to do it so bad for Reggie. Right. But you know what's crazy too, that Reggie probably, that situation was so bad that it forced him to retire. And at that point in time, I didn't tell anyone, but I knew in my mind that it was time for me to retire. We talked about the fans of Indiana and how they're all in. I think that that left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, that, that brawl, that scene. Maybe for the first time, basketball wasn't enjoyable for me. And the maturity level wasn't the same. And trying to teach them respect to be on time and to go over the playbooks and they didn't want to have any parts of it. They just wanted to have fun. A lot of these younger players just wanted to show up and it frustrated me. Yeah. Reggie had probably two more years in it. Really? Mm-hmm. Just a lot. It was like a lot, more on That mental side. This person that is presenting me tonight, Reggie Miller, is the best shooter that I've ever seen in my life. My favorite player growing up was Reggie Miller. Reggie, Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller. Number 31. Reggie. Reggie has had a profound effect on my early years in the NBA. I would come out on the floor thinking I was early, and he was already out there, and Reggie had a Superman shirt on. And when you see somebody, your opponent, wearing a Superman shirt, you have to ask yourself, how do I beat Superman tonight? It was impossible to guard you, Reggie. Reggie would grab my arms, and he would throw me in one direction and go in the other. And then the coach would get mad at me. And I said, they didn't, Coach Calhoun didn't teach me that in college. I learned so much, and I appreciate your example, the bar you set. To, to be able to break your record, I didn't know this record existed. So thank you for everything you did for me and this game. I love watching Reggie, just the way he moved on the court. Reggie again. Yes. Oh, the way that Reggie moved without the ball was second to none. And he had that clutch thing that everybody wants. Uh, I saw back in 2007 they tried to get you to come out of retirement yeah. and that the they was the Boston Celtics and right. what what was the process to figure out at 42 you could possibly join Garnett and Ray and Pierce and Boston. Yeah, this proposed trade has been agreed to and will occur. Seattle will send Ray Allen 
to Boston for the number five pick. This is a blockbuster trade. It's been talked about for years. KG no longer a wolf. He's going to the Boston Who, South by the pick. way, went on to win an NBA championship that, that year. year. Yeah. yeah. The moves that just happened to bring Ray and uh, KG. So this is August. This is August. Of 07. Uh, I would say late August. Yeah. And uh, I get the phone call that, you know, they're thinking about adding me to the roster. Danny called me and was like, look, I think you'd be a great piece. You know, you can come off the bench, which I had no problems with doing, you know, play 15, 20 minutes a game, spread the floor. Uh, had you been working out? Did, no. Did you ever stop working out when you, when you stopped playing? I did. I, I've always been a workout fanatic, but not basketball. I had done more mountain biking, right. road biking, okay. you know, running, um, 10Ks, things like that. But not like a that. bunch of shooting. N not a lot of shooting. Yeah. You know, some, some, yeah. some pick up games with the Pepperdine kids and things like that, but nothing serious where I'm going every single day. So I hadn't picked up the basketball in a while, and I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. So I went out and, as we call it, I went to shock my body. And it was the end of August, and the Celtics, he needed an answer within two weeks because they were getting ready to go over seas to Italy or they France. went to Rome, right. They yeah. went to Rome yeah. to play in some type of tournament, a bonding trip for the Celtics. And he needed to know before then. I always tell Danny this and tell people, if he had called in July and given me all summer. Like a two-month leave. If he had given me two months, it was too hard for me to shock my body in those two weeks, yeah. which I tried. I, so I went and I did three days, actually. Did you? to try to shock my body, and it, though the shooting was there, my legs weren't there. And if my legs aren't there, there's no way I can do an 82-game schedule. Did you guys ever have any friction when you played against each other? I didn't have friction with him, I had friction with Vlade, because Vlade was the instigator. He, he was always talking and flopping, me talking about flopping, yeah. <laughs> but flopping. So I, it was Vladi that I had problems. I never had problems with C. Webb, especially those great Sacramento teams. Yeah, I, I was I was a big fan of Reggie, but I didn't like him because he was always beating our teams. You know, like he was the catalyst. You know, I knew he was the one that's gonna be talking junk, getting in the guys, and so he was a guy like you always wanted to play with. But when you're playing against him, you just hate him. He's talking junk. You saw what he did to the Knicks. You see him kicking out. This is the human kickstand. I've named him because <laughs> when he shoots the three, all that, that leg stuff that he complains about when we do games, yeah, yeah he, he might have helped because invent all that. Uh, the, the kick out that got him to the free throw line so often. <laughs> Smitty, this, uh, this seems to have struck a nerve with you. Well, let me tell you, when you're out in the Eastern <laughs> Conference and we play four, maybe seven, eight times a year we play in the playoffs. And Reggie, ultimate competitor. We talk about competitors, I mean, to the fifth degree, because it was grab, hold. Reggie <coughs> would do whatever and, and, and it And you're takes. not. I didn't do as much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always uh, said, I tell kids, the endurance of Reggie Miller is phenomenal. I mean, he can run off the screen, get it run back off a screen, run off, and then still have the legs to shoot the basketball and shoot the basketball the same way, even though it was a different type of form. It still came off the same way, whether he was kicking, whether he was off balance, and it wasn't a lot of dribbling. Right. He was taking one dribble or no dribbles and still being able to shoot the basketball and still had that same endurance in fourth quarters and after 82 games in playoffs. How, you know, how did you I, prepare for him? Well, I, I think the one thing was I, I always wanted to send him to come off this way. Well, what I mean is shooting it off his left shoulder because I thought off his right shoulder he was real good at being able to take one dribble and get back to the baseline. I wanted him to keep it in his right hand to drive the basketball to make a play. But preparing for him, it was, it was teammates, Grant Long, guys that were bigs that could switch out. That was the only way you had a chance, I thought, with Reggie Miller to have a big that could switch. You know, now, did the coaches or the, or the players, were they like, hey, you know, Reggie sending a limo for you tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> like, uh, when? Well, when you, you know, when, did Lenny ever say, hey, you know, to, to try to get you to guard him a certain way, you know, he say, hey, Smitty, Reggie going to send a limo for you tonight. He's going to get 50 on you. How did he, no, you know? I, my thought process, the best way to guard a Reggie Miller was to post him up and get him in foul trouble. That's what I wanted to do, to post him up and get him in foul trouble, to take away some of his aggression. One thing, one thing Smitty, I guarded him a little bit too. 
<clears throat> and because he was, wasn't one of those guys that had the ball in his hands and make a play, he came off of screens. You had to really be lock. disciplined and focus and, and lock and trail. And so with shooters, you don't want to give them any space. You want to be up on them. You know, when they catch the ball, you want to be right there. And so as he's, tra as he's curling the screen and coming off and, and as you're going by, that, you know, kicking that foot out, either way, whether he's coming off the right shoulder or left shoulder, it, it really became a challenge because you didn't want to get too close. It's like you want to do your work early. You want to try to ride him through the screen. But as he catches it and he's kicking that foot, whether from three or from two or whatever, it's like, well, they're going to call that foul on me. And it just became, he became unguardable in that sense well, because they, yes. you well, have to get up on him. Well, they, they say call Kevin, foul Kevin Durant was like with the first, Reggie was one of the first to me because if you were close to Reggie, he was taking him and, and, him and, him. Yeah. and I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Let me know down below by hitting that like button, commenting down below which player you would like to see next. Hit that subscribe button and hit that notification button to stay up to date with all the new episodes. Here are two videos that you may enjoy as well.